All right, folks. So we've we've basic we've come up with the basic definitions and terms of a solution, and now we're going to start talking about solubility. So we're going back to really chapter four. Remember, we well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm expanding the definition of polar and nonpolar. That is from chapter four. I'm saying these are polar. And if we drew those Lewis structures, they would be just fine. They would look exactly like what we said in chapter four. Now I'm adding to that really, really, really polar. So you might say, okay, polar molecules, what are those? You might stop the video for a second and say, wait, what do those have in common? All right, did you think about that? Good. Let's go over here and look at these nonpolar. Here's our nonpolar. We said that's a category of nonpolar. We said this was a category of nonpolar. And here's something new that we're adding that's nonpolar. We looked at this really a little bit in chapter 8. So let's start with this polar substances, polar molecules. We said, oh yeah, polar molecules. Remember, if there's anything different on the central atom, we say it's polar. And that's always our guess. Now, what is this category right here? Well, you recognize it. Ionic compounds. Now, that's not that far-fetched. We said there was Nonpolar, polar, ionic. So, ionic is just the extreme case of polar. So, okay, polar molecules, ionic compounds, we're going to say are polar. If I go over here, nonpolar molecules, chapter four. Remember earlier on we said anything that has carbon and hydrogen only, that fits right there. Now, this group right here, those three are atoms. Those three are molecules. What do they have in common? If you looked at those six, you'd say, oh, they do have something in common. You stop the video and think about that. All right, you got it? Here's what we had up there. We had non-polar molecules. That is to say, compounds that are made up of nonpolar molecules. The second group we said hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons. C and H only. That's nothing new. And lastly we're going to say non-metal non-metal elements. And these can be atoms or molecules. Remember, many nonmetals, just elements, are atoms, but many of them come in twos. For instance, there's an O2 atom, an N2 atom, an H2 atom. Have no fear of ice cold beer. Okay, so we've expanded polar. and nonpolar. Just a little bit to add to our definitions from before. Let's look at page 5, 9.5. And I want to think about the, the solution process, like what has to break up, what has to uh, stick together when a solution forms. Well, we've said from chapter 5, sodium chloride is water soluble. Put sodium chloride in water I get sodium ions and I get chloride ions. If you put silver chloride in water and you go back and look at our solubility rules, here's what you get. Ag Cl solid. It does not dissolve. So what we have to think about is, well wait, these were sticking together and now this is sticking to water and this is sticking to water. These were sticking together, water was sticking together, but they wouldn't mix. They wouldn't form a solution. 
So let's go back and look at this. This is going to be a little bit tricky, but so damn fascinating. I cannot resist. Okay. To get sodium chloride to dissolve in water, I had to break up the sodium chloride. I had to break those things up. That was endothermic. Now, it was also, it was higher in entropy, right, once we break it up. So endothermic nature says, I don't really want to do that. Messier nature says, yeah, I like that. Same thing here. I had water sticking to water. Now I've got to separate those water molecules to make room for the sodium and the chloride atoms. So I've got to break up water molecules. Water says, well, I don't really want to do that, but makes them messier, more spread out. Now, the payoff is this. Break up, break up, and look what I get to form. I get to form that, and I get to form that. That is exothermic. That's bonds forming. Little smiley face. Now, those bond forming are a little less messy. But the overall net effect, we've been saying from day one, well, things dissolve because it does make them messier. So let's say, let's say, well, overall, it's safe to assume that we're probably going to get something messier. So that's favorable. Now, what do we need over here? Well, this is where it gets a little tricky. That's what we need. We need that side to be exothermic. Energy to break up, break up, form. The total better be exothermic, or it helps a lot if it's exothermic. Now let's think about that. This is bonds formed minus, no, excuse me, bonds broken minus bonds formed. That's my total delta H. Well, this is the payoff, right? I get to form these. There's my exothermic part. Well, if this is weaker than this or this, nothing's going to happen. These had better be at least about as strong as the bonds that were holding together the solute and the solvent particles. Now, here's what that means. This solute solvent particle IMFs have to be about as strong as the solute solute and the solvent solvent forces. These better be about as strong. So I can just say, well, those that we bro or formed are about as strong, about as strong as Solute, solute, IMFs, whatever they are, and solvent, solvent, IMFs. It's basically saying whatever we got here better be strong enough to offset the forces that we needed to break up there. Now that boils down to this really simple thing. Polar solvent solutes that are stuck together by say dipole dipole or hydrogen bonding or ionic bonding, they will be happy to dissolve in polar solvents where they can get a similar kind of interaction Nonpolar solutes tend to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. And again, it says that solute solvent particle interactions are going to be strong enough that they'll sort of match the initial polar IMFs. Nonpolar, nonpolar is not very strong, so all it, it can only happen if the initial things that were sticking together were held together by, say, London dispersion forces. That is so cool. We get to know that from this simple little thing. I love this stuff. 
Well, we can even make sort of a silly and a little mnemonic. We say polar stuff dissolves in polar stuff. Polar solvents dissolve polar solutes. Nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. Or we say this, like dissolves like. Cool. Let's look at 9.6. Now, I don't know, at one time I thought, uh, well, I find all this stuff to be so fascinating. At one time I thought, well, why don't I sort out all the sort of different solute, solvent interactions. But this semester, everything's gone to hell. No, let's not do that. Well, let's look down here and let's see if we can apply this. So what we're looking for are pairs of, it says, which will form a solution? Well, nonpolar with nonpolar, polar with polar, but a mix of the two, it's unlikely, but not impossible, but it's much less likely that a solution will form. So why don't you go through A through I there and say, okay, which of these are polar with polar, a solution will form, nonpolar with nonpolar, a solution will form. Stop the video, take a minute or two, chat with uh, classmates virtually, and then I'll come back and give away the answers. All right, did you try it? I'm just looking for pairs that are similar. Nonpolar, polar. Nope. Nonpolar, ionic, extreme polarity. Nope. Switching pens. Nonpolar, nonpolar. Yep. That stuff will dissolve quite nicely. Gasoline's a bunch of hydrocarbons, I mean, like 10 or 20 different compounds. They're obviously soluble. They stay together. This one might be a little trickier. I see, oh, there's a, some hydrogen bonding, some hydrogen bonding going on. There's an awful lot of nonpolar part there, but it's reasonable to say, eh, probably pretty soluble. Polar, nonpolar, nope. Polar ionic, yep. Polar, no, excuse me, nonpolar, polar, no, nope. hydrogen bonding is not going to happen. Nonpolar, nonpolar, yep. And lastly, nonpolar and ionic, extreme polarity, nope, won't happen. All right, so that gives us a way to make predictions. Uh, before we can fine tune the water solubility of the ionic compounds using our solubility rules, but now we can make some pretty good guesses about everything else. Now here's kind of an interesting term. Here I've got beer, mostly water, a little alcohol. Vodka, mostly alcohol, a little bit of water. So I want to maybe stop the video and say, well, for beer, what's the solvent and the solute? For vodka, What's the solvent? What's the solute? Stop the video. Think about that. All right, you stopped and you figured it out, right? Well, solvent's what there's mostly for beer. Water. Beer's 90, 95% water. Solute, alcohol. If beer's only about 5 or 10% alcohol at most, I suppose. Um, there we go. Major component, minor component. But look at vodka. The solvent for vodka, well, it looks to me like it's alcohol. Oh, let me rewrite that. Alcohol. And there's just a tiny bit of water. So there we go. Now, when this happens, where you say, well, wait a minute, can water be the solvent and alcohol can be the solute? Can they flip places? We say that the term we usually use is miscible. What it means is this. It's two liquids that are 100% soluble, sort of in each other. Maybe we say completely soluble. Completely. Completely soluble. Another way to think about it is the solute and the solvent are completely interchangeable. You can make put more of one or more of the other. So we'll say solute, solvent are interchangeable. Interchangeable. 
interchangeable. Okay, let's look at one last thing and then we'll look at a demo. Page 9.8, it says, it, sodium chloride is very soluble in water. We've been saying that since uh, chapter five. Well, all right, so this is my high-tech setup. There's some water. Now, I'm gonna put a little bit of salt in there. Some salt, there's my water. So I'll sprinkle a little salt in there. Can you see that? Let me turn that by the way. Maybe that helps. Oh yeah, there we go. Oh nice. I'm a cinematographic genius. Something. All right, there's my salt now. If I swirl that around. All right. Sorry, I had to I had to pause the video because it wasn't dissolving very very fast. Now those are just water. I mean, those are just water. Those are just little air bubbles at the bottom. I promise that's not salt. They're just some little air bubbles. I did give it a little stir with a spoon. I put some bubbles in there. So we'd say, well, yeah, it doesn't surprise us. That's kind of what we've said from uh, chapter five. We've said, yeah, that should be pretty soluble. Get rid of some of those bubbles. Yeah, see, they're just bubbles. Okay, so we say, well, water or salt is soluble in water, but there's a limit. I can stir this and shake this. And let that settle out for a minute. And you'll be able to see, well, I may not be at the limit there. Let me add a little more. There we go. Now if I stir it up a bit, oh, that's good. Stir that up a little bit. And let it sit. I'm going to pause it, the recording just for a second to let that settle out. Well, now that the cloudiness has sort of settled out, you can see that there's still salt there, solid salt. And maybe even if I tip it a little more, now you can see there's solid salt at the bottom of that. Oh, that's no good. You can see there's still solid salt there. So we say sodium chloride is soluble in water, but there's a limit to this. Now let's, I'm gonna pop. Presto, I made the beaker disappear. Okay, so sodium chloride is very water soluble, but there is a limit. There is a limit to this solubility. And what we say is there is, uh, the limit is saturated. When we reach the limit that is saturated, basically you can think of it as the water can't hold any more of the solute. Like, that's it. It's maxed out for that amount of water. Now, I'm going to do um, a demo video that will follow this. But, um, well, yeah, I'm just going to leave this. Here's the limit. Uh, I looked at one of those hot packs. It holds 70 milliliters of water. The limit in water for sodium acetate is 35 grams in 70 milliliters. It turns out the amount that is dissolved in that sort of hand warming heat package is about 50. So here's saturated. And here is what? So I've got this thing now. So is it saturated or unsaturated? Well, it's extremely saturated. Let's look at some terms, and then I'll follow this up with a, with a really cool video I found on YouTube to kind of demonstrate this. So, unsaturated. We can say that unsaturated, the solvent has capacity to hold more. Like, that's when I put in a little salt and swirled it. So, solvent 
has capacity to hold, dissolve more solute. Saturated, that's it. That's that point where I kept dumping more salt in and no more would go in. So I said, well, no more solute, no more solute can dissolve into solution. Let me do this and this. What we saw here, once the sort of cloudiness disappeared, we had our beaker and our beaker, and we dumped it in, swirled it around, and it just looked clear. We couldn't see anything at all. The second time, after I dumped quite a bit more in there, what we saw is you can see solid solute sitting at the bottom. That stuff was sitting right there. So unsaturated, I dumped it in, swirled it, and it disappears into solution. Saturated, as soon as I have a solution where the solid is sitting on the bottom, I know I'm at the saturated situation. Now this is super saturated. So super saturated is amount of the solute, amount of solute in solution exceeds the capacity of the solvent. It's like, well, in theory, we should only be able to get 35 grams of sodium acetate per 70 milliliters of water. But somehow we've exceeded that. So the funny thing is, it looks like this. It just looks like that. It looks like a solution. Now I'm going to, after this, there's the demo, the video uh, you'll see, and you'll see what happens. So here it is. Seems perfectly fine. We're going to barely tweak it, and it's going to radically change. All right, enjoy the next video. It's really cool.